let's make a start. Um, in the previous year of these <coughs> lectures, I looked at the uh, issues raised by uh, people in faith communities uh, relating to the market economy. I, and the whole thing is about the role of religion in a liberal state. And obviously, a market economy is part of living in a liberal uh, political and social order. And last year was devoted to uh, trying to tease out some of the issues at stake in some of the uh, disputes and so forth about uh, the role of the market economy in relation to a whole range of uh, human values and so forth. Uh, and, and this year is about uh, the relationship between uh, religion and the sort of framework of rights which typically um, liberal societies operate with. And um, we've looked at various aspects of that. And one of the key ideas is that um, a liberal political order will recognise and somehow institutionalise a set of basic rights uh, to constrain uh, the role and power of majorities so, so that uh, majorities can't do just what they like with the citizens of a liberal society. They have certain rights which must be respected and we've looked at how we might uh, think about some of those rights. Uh, but today what I want to do is to talk partly about uh, religious identity and freedom of expression, but relate that more particularly to some rather detailed issues about rights, which um, I, I hope you'll find uh, interesting. Um, one of the commonly invoked uh, criticisms of rights is that they just seem to appear from nowhere. People just sort of claim their rights and where have they come from, what are they, what grounds do they have, what sort of uh, uh, authority do they have, and so on. Well, <coughs> one argument about that, which has been pretty central to both religious and secular uh, views of rights, is that rights exist to protect human dignity in some way or another. Uh, that as human beings, uh, we possess a certain kind of inherent dignity and worth, uh, which is protected by rights, and that m majorities cannot just impose their will on individuals if imposing that will abridges their rights, or to put it another way, abridges their dignity as human beings. Now, given that we're talking about human rights, uh, if we're trying to think about what does human dignity consist in, then it has to be uh, some feature of human life that is not dependent upon a particular kind of situation in which you find yourself. That is to say, it's not the rights just of a British citizen or an Irish citizen. It's not the rights of a member of this religion or that religion. It's not the rights of a member of this gender or that gender. These rights are the rights of human beings considered independently of the particular nation in which they're born, the particular culture into which they're born, the particular religion into which they're born, and so on. That they are rights that somehow we hold in virtue of our humanity. And some aspect of the dignity that we have as human beings in relation to that overall and overarching human humanity. So the initial question, I think, is this. What kind of feature of human life is it, or set of features for that matter, what is it that makes us bearers of dignity and worth, which doctrines about rights then sort of recognise? And there have been endless attempts to answer uh, this question, both from uh, within a religious perspective, particularly to do with natural law, natural law 
and also from a secular perspective. And therein lies one of the problems about dignity in that while uh, that people may worry about the seemingly um, rather random uh, range of human rights, uh, to say that they're founded on a conception of human dignity about which we also disagree uh, doesn't help very much with, um, uh, with, with grounding in a firm sort of way any particular list of rights that we think we might have as human beings. But just to elaborate on that a bit, we can think about dignity in, in, in one of two ways, I think. One is what you might call a thick way, uh, a, an elaborate way, which is probably rooted most, founded most, in religious uh, perspectives, that our dignity as human beings depends upon on this view in our being created in the image of God or something like that, that our dignity is God-given. God um, well, apart from the fact that if the argument for dignity is entirely confined uh, to a religious perspective, it's not going to have much purchase for those who don't hold that perspective. But there is also quite a, another quite deep issue here, and it's this. If you say that our dignity is dependent upon our being made in the image of God, then what happens when we undertake actions and activities and so forth uh, which are incompatible with what we think we know about the aims, goals and purposes of God for human existence. Uh, do, do we lose our dignity if we live a holy sort of, well, to put, you know, put it bluntly, sinful life? Or does our dignity still shine through as a human being, even though we're not living in the image of God because we have chosen to behave in a way that's incompatible with that image. So one of the problems for a religious perspective on human rights is how is it uh, that, the, um, that human rights can persist and be attached to all people everywhere, even if they are not living in a way that's sanctioned by the notion of being created in the image of God. So, so there's an issue there about how, if you're coming from to, the, to this issue from a faith communi community, how is it that, you, I mean, do you think people lose their rights because they're no longer acting in a way that's consistent with the idea of, um, uh, of being born in the image of God and God having ideas about our essential purposes as human beings. The other alternative view of dignity is to take it as a very thin idea. That is to say, to say perhaps as little about it as we can, other than asserting that we have dignity as uh, human beings. And the argument here has typically been uh, that our dignity rests upon some kind of unique characteristics of being human, which and those characteristics are not shared by other uh, elements of creation, as it were. Um, that there, are, there are characteristics of being human that constitute our humanity. That humanity is the source of our dignity and rights protect that dignity. So what are these characteristics of human beings uh, that, as it were, ground our dignity? Well, First of all, it can't be just any old thing about human beings. I mean, there might be certain features of human life that are unique to human beings, but don't appear to have any connection whatsoever to ideas about human dignity or rights. I mean, it may well be, um, as somebody argued in the 19th century, that human beings are the only uh, animals with earlobes. Now, if that's true, it doesn't mean that we should respect the dignity of human beings because they've got earlobes. There has to be some connection between what is essential to our humanity and an idea of how people then ought to be treated. I mean, absolutely nothing follows from the fact that we've got earlobes about how we ought to be treated. 
So what we're looking at is not some kind of empirical characteristic of human beings, but something about human beings that is morally relevant, that gives us a ground for treating people in one way rather than another way. And historically, the obvious answer to this question that was best formulated, I think, in philosophy by uh, the German philosopher Immanuel Kant is that human, humanity, if you like, uh, rests upon our capacity for autonomy, for choice, for freedom, if you like, for living a life shaped by our own choices, our own purposes, and so forth. Now, if our dignity as human beings consists in exercising and having this capacity for choice, as Kant believed and as many people have believed since him, then there's a big difference between that and the initial religious idea of dignity that I started with. Because the religious idea of dignity is that you have this dignity because you are enjoined to live in a certain kind of way, that, that, that your dignity is to be born in the image of God and depends upon living a life that follows and embodies what God wants for human beings as the creatures that he's created. Now, the choice theory of rights takes entirely the opposite view, that, that ends, goals, purposes of human life are a matter of choice for individuals. They are not to be derived from the uh, from, 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 from a theistic perspective at all, and that our dignity resides in exercising that choice. That that there are a whole range of things that we might do, and we can choose between them. And it's our dignity as human beings rests upon that choice, exercising that choice, not on following some kind of moral code, uh, as might be true of uh, theism. Now, let's just pursue that idea for a bit, that, that, um, that, that human dignity rests upon choice and, or autonomy, um, something like that. One of the problems with that is that it seems to make everything sort of too cut and dried. Um, Just think about some counter-examples. If you say human beings' dignity resides in their capacity for choice and um, all people have that capacity and it's protected by rights. Well, of course, all people don't happen to have that capacity. I mean, someone who is born with some kind of uh, very severe uh, mental impairment, uh, someone who... Uh, perhaps as a result of a car accident or something, uh, is in a persistent vegetative state uh, and, and all of that. These, these people have either lost or have never had the capacity for an autonomous life, for the ability to choose and so forth. Now, if, if rights are based upon the capacity for choice, what do you then say about people who have lost that capacity or have never had that capacity? Do you say, as you ought to do consistently, well, they don't have rights then, because rights protect this inherent capacity uh, for choice. And many people think that's just too uh, blasé, uh, really. We've got to be uh, much more sensitive to the issue of how of what sort of line do we draw between those with rights and those without rights? There's a legal term that's sometimes used in this context that, that, that the, these people who are outside the framework of liberal rights would be legal outlaws, and you can see why that's said. They're outlaws in a literal sense in that the law about rights doesn't apply to them because they have either lost or have never had those features of human life that ground uh, human rights. So we, if, if, if you take the view that rights are a matter of uh, uh, respecting the choices of individuals, you've got to um, get some way 
around that kind of issue. And I just want to leave that hanging in the air for the moment and, and, and move on to something else, but we will uh, be coming back to it, particularly next year when I want to talk about liberal ideas about things like autonomy in the context of <coughs> issues like abortion and euth euthanasia and so forth. Um, but for the moment, let's just park the idea that rights seem to need grounding, but there's not an obvious, undisputed set of grounds that can be appealed to as a basis for uh, rights. In the European Convention on Human Rights, which is embodied uh, in the Human Rights Act up to a point in UK law, in Article 9, uh, th th there is a right to freedom of religious belief. And that right in the sense of belief is absolute. There is a more conditional right to the manifestation of belief, uh, so long as it doesn't, as it were, uh, in harm the interests of other people or harm the interests of uh, the society as a whole, uh, that in those circumstances uh, then uh, religious uh, belief uh, is protected by rights, as are, of course, uh, many other things under the, under the Convention. So what does it mean to say uh, that uh, the manifestation of religious belief is conditionally um, supported by rights or conditionally sanctioned by rights, conditionally because it may harm the interests of others and you've got, you've got to be open to, to that issue. Well, according to the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, what this actually means is that any manifestation of religion, which can also just be saying something, it doesn't have to be a practice like um, slaughter or any, any of those sorts of things, it can just be asserting something, that any manifestation of religion has to be compatible with human dignity and with the values of a democratic society. So immediately we get on to this issue of dignity. What is it about dignity? Because what the court is saying is we can interfere with the right to manifest religion if that manifestation is incompatible with the recognition of the dignity of other people as right holders and or uh, incompatible uh, with democratic values. And it's important to recognise this because um, probably about three years now it was, um, Pope Benedict, as he then was, uh, went to Spain. And one of his complaints in Spain uh, was that European um, rights doctrines made it impossible for him now to say what he thought was wrong about homosexuality. Because, because he would regard homosexual behaviour as sinful, to say that, which is, as it were, Catholic doctrine, but to say it to the world at large, was incompatible with the idea of um, the jurisprudence of the Court of Human Rights, which says that you can only manifest your religion if it's consistent with other people's dignity and democratic values, which um, clearly saying something like that, well, it, even if it isn't obvious, it would be certainly challenged. And the Pope was saying that rights doctrines are making it more and more difficult for a church or a religious community to say outside its own community what they think is wrong about some... Um, um, social uh, practice, usually sexual, but not necessarily so. So the idea is then that rights to manifest religion have to be compatible with the basic rights of others because that is in what human dignity resides, according to the European Court, 
and it has to be compatible uh, with human values. And in this country, when the Human Rights Act was being um, discussed in Parliament and, and in the run-up to that, many of the leading judges of that time also wrote articles and so forth to say that in their view, the justification for the Human Rights Act was that it was the, it, it, it reflected basic human values to do with dignity and respecting others, and also uh, to do with the basic values of a democratic society. So given that, and given that we've now got the Human Rights Act, and indeed the Equality Act, which protects certain characteristics of human beings against discrimination, and these characteristics, which can be age, which can be gender, which can be religion, uh, which can be sexual orientation and so forth, these protected characteristics are also regarded as being central to human dignity and human worth and democratic values. So on this view, we've got both the Human Rights Act and the Equality Act and all the European jurisprudence that goes with the European Court of Human Rights, which we bought into, um, and those provide the sort of space within which religion now has to operate. And of course, many people from a religious point of view are entirely happy and pleased with that um, if, if they hold their religious views in a sort of reasonably liberal way. However, many other people are extremely ex exercised about it for the sort of reason I just mentioned from uh, Pope Benedict. Um, now, one thing that's important here is that if we've got incompatibilities between rights, right to manifest religion on the one hand and the right of someone not to be, as they might see it, vilified, by the exercise of that religious right, if we've got a conflict of rights, then on the European court's uh, sort of basis for thinking about these things, we have to recognise that both sides of this, this dispute have issues of dignity uh, on each side, that, the, that, say, the gay person has a right not to be described as sinning uh, in a public place by the Pope. Equally, the Pope, or any Catholic for that matter, just to take that as an example, has a right to freedom of religious belief and a conditional right to the manifestation of that belief. It isn't, in the European court's view, the idea that one has the basic right and the other doesn't. It is that both, both parties to these disputes have the idea of human dignity as they understand it on their side. It's just that they don't understand dignity necessarily in the same way. So given that both parties to the dispute, and the court is very keen on this because it doesn't want to create what it calls legal outlaws, both sides of the dispute their rights are recognised and their dignity is, as it were, respected. So how are these disputes to be resolved then? Well, one of the arguments used in uh, the European Court has been um, that we've got to adjudicate on the basis of a sort of thin theory of human dignity, to use the term I used a few minutes ago. That is to say, the court cannot appeal to, let's say, a religious, or for that matter, highly philosophical account of human dignity, because many people who are subject to the jurisdiction of the human rights regime either won't know about it, or won't care about it, or possibly quite even wouldn't understand it. So it's got to be a thin doctrine of dignity that the court invokes and uses. And that thin doctrine of dignity is by and large about individual choice. 
it's very much favouring, uh, as it turns out, the kind of uh, uh, Kantian view, if I could call it that, uh, that human rights depend crucially upon individual choice and individual autonomy. Um, and the reason why the courts won't really recognise the thick view of dignity, the one based upon particularly upon religious belief, is, I think, because it is based upon faith, which it, they regard as a, a, an entirely defensible but purely private thing, whereas the other aspects of dignity, the thin view of dignity, is based upon something, some kind of uh, what's come to be called public reason. That is to say, to, it depends upon a set of views which can be shared by everybody and which can be, up to a point at least, factually um, argued for and are, broadly speaking, empirical uh, considerations. So the reason why the courts want to adjudicate in terms of the thin view of dignity is that a thicker view is going to be uh, highly morally controversial. It can't invoke doctrines about the purposes of God for human life or anything like that. It has to be a doctrine about individual choice and the protection of individual choice. And it's that individual choice that also lies at the basis of the toleration of religious belief, because that also is a matter of choice. So within a Christian, let's say Christian, it could be any other faith community, within a Christian community, then it's perfectly okay uh, for people uh, to understand dignity as being based upon their theological views, but it's not okay to export that theological understanding of human dignity into the kind of public realm, uh, because if it does, then it's excluding those people who don't have the faith in those, um, th those religious uh, conceptions. So, um, how do we get around this then, or how do we deal with it? Uh, the, the court is going to adjudicate, and you can see this through all the cases, it has to adjudicate on the basis of a thin uh, doctrine of human dignity, which more or less boils down uh, to the idea, as I've said, of dignity residing in our capacity for autonomous uh, choice. Now, of course, many people, but particularly religious people, don't see the most important thing about their life being their capacity for autonomy or their capacity for choice. For many religious people, what matters to them is uh, following the will of God and so forth and living a life of religious discipleship. And for them, autonomy uh, may not mean anything very much at all if it... If it uh, if it's put to them, it, it, can be, um, it, it can be a subordinate thing or it may not be on their list of values at all. So the, the, the problem then is that for a religious person who doesn't necessarily value autonomy that much, and I'll come on to some of the reasons why that might be so in a few minutes, but for the religious person the invocation of a thin view of dignity, one based upon freedom of choice, uh, won't necessarily appear uh, to be all that attractive a basis for uh, political loyalty. Why should I feel loyalty to a legal order, uh, the core idea of which, namely human dignity, isn't based upon a conception of dignity that I share? And that, that's, the, that's the kind of politico-legal uh, problem here. Well, the court wants to get around this by saying that its judgments must be uh, based on the principle of proportionality, uh, which is a very important uh, concept, particularly in uh, European uh, legal contexts, that, that, the, that the, the judgments that are made 
must be based upon uh, the idea of proportionality. And this in turn, I mean, what, sorry, what that means particularly is that um, you have to take into account all the factors in a situation, the disputed rights, where those claims of right are coming from in terms of their background and so forth, but also you have to bear in mind uh, that what's at stake here isn't just what's in dispute between the, 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 the two rights that are in um, conflict, but, but the whole coherence of the framework of rights, because if you can't resolve a conflict of rights, then it's not at all clear how the framework as a whole will fit together uh, subsequently. So there has to be a degree of proportionality. And what that means in practice is this, and this was made clearest, I think, by the German uh, Constitutional Court, uh, that there has to be, as part of proportionality, there has to be what the German court calls practical concordance. That is to say that people must be prepared, those who have got clashing rights claims, must be prepared to not push their claims to the absolute limit. There must be a willingness to compromise, to regard the solution to the problem as being more important than you're getting your own way at the court in relation to the right that you are claiming. That there has to be what the Germans called practical concordance, because without that, we will have a whole list of utterly incompatible rights claims which cannot be uh, put into any kind of order or reconciled. That is to say, for a religious person claiming a religious right, then that person must be prepared to accept the legitimacy of other views, say secular views, about whatever the dispute is about. Uh, so, um, uh, it boils down to saying, I believe so-and-so is true, I believe, you know, my belief in God is true and correct and all of that, uh, but I also recognise that it's open to you to disagree with me and that your disagreement with me is reasonable because I can't prove what I'm claiming, neither can you. So if we've got two parties to a dispute about rights, neither of which can be uh, fully resolved, then we have to accept that there's going to have to be, if we're going to get any solution at all, there has to be compromise and a recognition on the part of each party that they recognize the reasonableness of other people's grounds for disagreement. So the secular person has to recognize that there is a reasonable case for disagreeing with whatever the right is about. The religious person also has to recognize that there is a basis on which uh, other people can reasonably disagree with you. Now, this is quite important because religious fundamentalism, of course, is entirely opposed to any such idea. Uh, because if the central thing of practical concordance, to use the German's term for it, if the central thing about practical concordance is the recognition of the need for compromise and the reasonableness of other people's disagreements with you, then the fundamentalist can't accept that because for him or her, what you know, there is just truth and they know what it is, so why should they compromise? Why should they uh, compromise just to uh, win a case in the uh, secular uh, courts? So there is this, this problem um, about because it, it comes down to this, really, and this is quite a, an interesting feature of this argument, um, that it may well turn out 
that maintaining a liberal society, including these rights, is going to involve the idea that people can only hold their religious views in terms of manifest manifesting their beliefs, can only hold their, their religious views in terms of manifesting their beliefs in a liberal manner. They can't hold them as fundamentalists because they will not then participate in the process of proportionality which requires practical uh, concordance, to use this term from the, the German court. So the idea is that, as, uh, that if I'm a religious person, then I have to accept the reasonableness of your disagreement with me. And on the face of it, a fundamentalist cannot go down that road, which of course means, as I said, that uh, liberalism seems to require that religious points of view are held in a liberal manner, meaning by that the recognition of the reasonableness of disagreement. And that there's a sort of oddity about this because liberalism has usually been claimed since the 17th century as something that respects uh, civil society, that is to say, all the institutions, and perhaps most particularly churches, uh, which are not state-sanctioned or elements of the state, but rather that th they are voluntary organisations, in a sense, and that voluntary organisations should be able to do what they like and regulate themselves if they need regulating and so on, without the state moving in. Whereas on this view, the state does dictate, in a sense, how a religious belief can be held, at least in terms of the manifestation of it. But uh, most people will argue that um, there's no great problem here because we have to recognise the, pri the primacy, in a sense, of social unity, social peace, which requires compromise, which requires proportionality, which requires trade-offs. But is that, is that true? I mean, there are certainly many uh, American, particularly theological writers, and I'm thinking here particularly of uh, Stanley Harabas in his book, uh, Community of Character, who argues that it's not the, it's not the Christian's job to somehow elevate the idea of social peace or social unity above the demands of his or her belief. And he says, uh, in a rather, well, it depends, I mean, I, I, find, I find it a slightly uh, spooky kind of idea, the Christian is someone who must, not, not can, but must live out of control. That is to say, the Christian is someone who cannot subordinate his religious values to any other kind of secular requirement to live a peaceable life. It's not that. It's that um, you cannot be asked to subordinate your beliefs to some kind of social requirement. So that's, that's one element of the whole thing about how you can manifest belief. And uh, the, the conventional view, as I've said, you can manifest your religious belief so long and in so far as it is compatible, what, what you're doing is compatible, with the idea of democratic values and the dignity of all other people as recognised in their individual rights. So that's the, that's the kind of formulaic framework within which the manifestation of religion occurs. But there is a kind of other element to this, which is, is really quite different, but I want to, to mention. Um, and it's this, that many uh, religious thinkers uh, are very dubious about the whole idea of rights, um, in the sense that they think it is a deformed sort of idea of what social and political and legal life should be about. And I'll I, I just quote from 
um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, Joan Lockwood O'Donovan here um, in an interesting article. Incidentally, the, there are two sort of off prints of stuff which I've used, of mine, which I've used for, for the purposes of thinking about this lecture. So then they'll be available at the end if you want one. Um, she says this, and it's quite a long quote, but it is one of the best sort of summations of the Christian particularly concern about rights. She says, the public realm suffers from moral monism, being enslaved to one universally acclaimed good, that of individual self-determination, or if you like, individual choice and autonomy, the public hegemony of this good is both disclosed and maintained in the public hegemony of the language of individual rights. Increasingly, in liberal democratic polities, all communal and institutional aims, aspirations and claims must be articulated in the individualist language in order to be heard. But this language, she says, is unsuited to express the purposes and structural laws of diverse communities. It is equally unsuited to express the goods and law of marriage, for example, personal communion <coughs> and sexual fidelity, or the bonds and duties of family life, namely parental care and filial obedience, or the purpose and normative structure of economic activity, production to fill material needs and the stewardship of natural resources, or of education, and so on and so on, she says, their various norms cannot be comprehended by the language of moral individualism. So if you take rights as the basic kind of building blocks of a liberal society, what she is saying is that given that those rights are there to protect the dignity of human autonomy, then a very great deal will either fall outside that range of rights, because they can't be comprehended within the range of rights, either that or um, they will be changed out of all recognition by the use of claims about rights within uh, those institutions. And whichever of these it is, it's a jolly bad thing in her view. We can't make sense in any way of the collective value of an institution that somehow isn't reducible to a framework for satisfying individual rights. And if we... I, I, so, so some things are going to fall outside the language of rights, and if they don't, if we want to reshape institutions based upon the language of rights, then those institutions will change out of all recognition. Now, of course, there are many other areas of life, apart from those that are, in a sense, uh, politically and legally uh, constituted, the ones she makes reference to, the laws of marriage and family life and so on. Uh, but there are other things as well, which either doesn't make sense to talk of as matters of right. So, for example, and I think I've mentioned this before, um, you can't uh, understand the idea of love in terms of rights. That if you say you've got a right to be loved, then who's going to have the duty to provide you with this love? And if it's a right, that duty is going to be enforceable. But if you try to enforce a right to be loved against someone else, then you've destroyed precisely what it is you're trying to find, namely, namely love, uh, because enforced love isn't love. Um, equally, just to, I mean, in the margin, I think this is why I thought I'd already mentioned it, I think it was last year's lectures. The same is true of the idea of the market in relation to love. I mean, you can't... When people say rather glibly these days, you don't value something unless you pay for it. And I'm always tempted to ask those people, well, you know, do you visit prostitutes very often then? Because, uh, you know, if, uh, if, if love is dependent upon paying for it, 
then you've destroyed it. Um, uh, so love is something that is neither rights-based nor market-based. And there are lots of other examples of the same sort. And to try to transform these into a set of rights, or for that matter, set of commodities, uh, is, um, is a big mistake on this view, because you're going to destroy precisely what it is you're looking for uh, in life. So we've got to accept and got to find space for, on this view, which I, I agree with myself, you've got to accept and find space for human practices, human relationships, and so forth, which cannot, or if not cannot, should not, uh, be reduced to claims about rights and claims about um, commodities. Um, and, and the same would be true of things like altruism. It's a good thing for people to be altruistic, and they may have a general duty to be altruistic, but that doesn't give anyone in particular a right to my altruism. There's a, um, a story that just sort of fixes this in your mind a little bit. There was a friend of mine in Manchester uh, when I was at Manchester University uh, used to go to the synagogue every uh, Sabbath and outside the synagogue uh, there would be someone asking for alms and he made it a kind of practice always to give uh, this person alms. And um, he wasn't a very rich man himself. And he, he said uh, one day, look, I can't give you anything today uh, because my son's getting married um, and, uh, and I need the money. And the chap, uh, the usual recipient of the money, said, uh, well, I'm pleased your son's getting married, but why is he getting married on my money? Um, you know, <laughs> uh, because it, uh, it, it looked, uh, you know, because he'd... He developed the idea that he had the right to altruism. Altruism is a duty, but it doesn't confer an individual right on anybody. So again, there's a whole area of life to do with altruism, to do with benevolence, to do with all of that, which cannot be made sense of either in terms of rights or, you know, again, to pick up from, from last year's lectures, or in terms of... Um, uh, commodities or, or, or monetary relations. And I think one of the tasks of the uh, churches, uh, just to finish on a slightly more sort of fervent note, if you like, is to try to explain and protect and witness to all those areas of social life which cannot be reduced in this way either to rights or to commodities and it seems to me that uh, those of a religious persuasion have got quite a good uh, basis for arguing that kind of case. This isn't to say that I don't think there are rights, I mean I certainly do uh, and I think the Human Rights Act is a very good kind of um, uh, framework for, think, uh, for, for dealing with these issues but we will go very wrong if we thought that we could somehow apply uh, rights-based <coughs> principles to all our, um, all our concerns. Well, as I said, uh, that there's a, there are a couple of pieces of uh, work outside. One is called Liberalism and Religion and the Public Sphere, and the other is Rights, Dignity and the Scope of Responsibility, which more or less are about what today's talk has been about. Just one final word um, in relation to the notion of the public sphere, which is a, um, a, a t just meaning the, you know, the area of politics and policy formation and all that kind of thing. Um, what, uh, what, what this is concerned with is the idea that arguments in politics and in public policy have to be cast in terms drawn from rights. And the Human Rights Act becomes what the American philosopher uh, John Rawls calls public reason. It provides you with the framework within which claims in politics have to be advanced or rejected, defended or whatever. Um, uh, and in a sense, it provides both a framework for, but also a limitation on, what sorts of arguments are available to us now 
in politics in a way that's consistent with the Human Rights Act. So um, I think it, uh, if you, you think about parliamentary um, um, debates on things like uh, gay marriage and so forth, um, most of the arguments uh, that were put uh, were, were largely of a secular sort, um, not invoking a religious conception um, by and large. I mean, some people did, uh, most others didn't. And, and that the Human Rights Act and the Equality Act provide the basis for public reason in a liberal democratic society. But it does mean that the churches, if they're to be heard, cannot just assert their claims on a religious basis, but have to ally themselves with claims that are made on a secular basis. And the best exam example of this, and I mention it in, the paper, in one of the papers, was over the equalization of the age of consent. When the churches were fervently opposed to that, although the bishops, as is not unusual, voted three ways in the House of Lords, four against and abstained, uh, but abstained in person, as it were, um, that, that, they, uh, uh, that, that they were opposed to that. But they, um, they tended to reconceptualize their arguments, not in terms of what religious belief required of them, but in terms of well, for want of a better word, the ubiquitous health and safety uh, kind of values, which have rather uh, replaced all other uh, compelling values because, of, for example, they argued that, that I mean, not just bishops, I don't mean, but those who were opposed to it, argued that uh, the rate of uh, sexual infection and so forth would increase and all that kind of thing. So there were kind of strong health and safety arguments in their view, but not... Uh, the religious arguments really did take a sort of back seat. So one of the effects of emphasis on human rights and so forth and on public reason is to displace the salience of religious argument in the public sphere and indeed in the view of the, some of the more vociferous uh, secularists to um, displace it altogether uh, from the public sphere. Right, well, we've got a few minutes for questions, if anybody... <laughs>